for you on the 50th anniversary, which is, what, 15 years ago? Anyway, I couldn't believe it, but I got a telephone call from CNN. Wow. In Atlanta. And uh, they asked me a few questions, and they said, uh, would you mind if we send a camera crew up to do an interview? So they did. I didn't, even, I didn't expect they'd even do it until I saw them drive in the driveway. <laughs> well, that's, uh, you know, you are, a, a, whether you chose it or not, you're a part of history. You were at a very uh, crucial uh, uh, turning point in, in uh, American history yeah. and world history as a whole there. Let me, one thing I want to do just before we get started, if I can get your name First and last name and the correct spelling so I have it on tape. So if you could... Yeah, the spelling on the letter is wrong. Oh, okay. So let's get it right here. L Lee, L-double-E, E-M-B-R-double-E. -E. Double E, okay. It had a Y, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is good because this gets it down correctly in history. So. Yeah. Now, you grew up where? Iowa. In Iowa. Huh. So... Where were you when Pearl? Well, I know. How did you get in the service? Because you got in prior to. Okay. Um, I came out uh, to Pasadena, California, with my uncle who lived there. He stopped by to visit my dad. They were brothers there back in Iowa. And I had uh, just finished a, a, a course in diesel engineering. Uh, which was correspondence course, and they had a school in Los Angeles. So I asked if I could go along with him, my uncle. He was driving a new uh, truck out to make a bus body out of, because uh, he was in the charter bus business in Pasadena. And so they made arrangements, and I came along with him. And uh, I went through the school, and I tried uh, walking the streets of Los Angeles to get a job, couldn't find one. And finally I got a job at uh, Douglas Aircraft in Santa Monica. Said, uh, be here at midnight for the graveyard shift tomorrow night. Well, a friend of mine that I had met in a diesel school came by and he says, let's jo go uh, join the uh, Army Air Corps. I said, hey, wait a minute, I just got a job over at Douglas. Oh, he says, come on, come on, let's go join the Army Air Corps. Well, it took me about five minutes to decide. I said, okay, let's go. So I never did show up for the Douglas job. But uh, I've often wondered how events would have changed, but I, don't, I can't see myself being a, a production line worker building aircraft. I, it's just not my type. And uh, so they assigned me to Marchfield, California. Now, how old are you at this point? I was 20, let's see, it was 1936, October 36. So I would have been uh, four or five. I would have been about 21, 21. And... Uh, so uh, they first assigned me to, after boot camp, to uh, the headquarters building as an aircraft dispatcher, which means that anybody going cross country or going, the pilots, they had come in and get a, fill out a, the paperwork, you know. And uh, at that, during that time period, it seems like uh, Hollywood people thought, uh, these uh, Air Force flyers and their uniforms were pretty sharp guys, and they, they came out there every weekend. There were some out there, and they had to come through my office to get, because they'd fly in, so they'd get a clearance to go out, they'd have to come in. So I met a lot of Hollywood people. But uh, then they come along and uh, they filmed the, the, the motion picture test pilot. Uh, that was filmed out there. And uh, so on our time off from working in the headquarters building, I watched them, and they said, hey, come on, you want to be an extra? Well, see, I was already employed by the Air Force, the Army, so uh, they couldn't really pay me, but they just gave me a $5 bill. 
<laughs> but that was fun because I got to meet uh, Clark Gable and Myrna Loy and Spencer Tracy and people like that. Wow. And uh, in fact, Clark Gable drove his Cadillac uh, Roadster out there every time. So a couple of us walked over and we were looking at it. I got in, sat down, and just, just looking at it. Pretty soon I heard a voice said, don't worry, I, you're not going very far. I got the keys in my pocket. Well, it was Clark Gable. He says, go ahead, say it. Look over. He was a real nice guy. But I didn't, this was really not my cup of tea. So I asked to be transferred to the reconnaissance squadron, 38th reconnaissance squadron. They did photography, uh, aerial photography. So I transferred over there and they said, uh, we have an opening up at Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. Uh, do you want to go to school up there? I said, sure. So I spent four months, I think it was, up there uh, going to the school and uh, came back and started doing aerial photography. Uh, and that was in 1939. What, at the school, what all did they did you? They just taught you how to use the cameras, or did you have to do developing? Oh, and... we did everything. Yeah, developing, uh, chemical mixing, uh, printing, uh, camera work, and uh, they took us up in uh, Douglas B eighteen to do aerial camera work, and we did the whole thing. And uh, because when we got back, they never knew what our assignment we were going to get when we got back to our home squadron, so we, they gave us the whole treatment, which I appreciated. Well then, um, we did a lot of uh, aerial survey work, uh, like back in those days, uh, the Mississippi River was having a lot of trouble with the levees breaking and flooding the land around there. So the Corps of Engineers ask us to photograph the Mississippi River from the mouth to the source, 10 miles on each side. They wanted it to do the, to, they were going to build levees uh, bigger and better so that it wouldn't have these floods. Then we did a mosaic of Catalina Island at uh, 32,000 feet. And we did all the camera work going back and forth. And then we processed the film. And then we had made the prints. And we laid out the mosaic then of a, of a photographic map of Catalina Island. It's that, that type of work. Uh, new airports that were under construction, we'd have to, uh, once a month, go and do a vertical photograph. I've got a a picture of Boeing Field over here, 1937, I think it is. Wow. Uh, a lot of, lot of history. But it was very interesting. Which, which, when, in, which camera were you using at that time? What did they use? A K3B, Fairchild, K3B. It weighed about 35 pounds. And uh, then... Um, we got orders to, let's see, in 19, early part of 40, 1941, we received orders to transfer to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, we did a lot of training out in the field on there. And then uh, in October of 41, we got orders to go to transfer us to Plum. Well, that was the code word for the Philippine Islands. And, of course, we know it, but nobody else did. So we uh, uh, flew to Hamilton Field uh, in the north part of San Francisco Bay, near San Rafael, on um, the 5th of December of '41. And uh, the next day, uh, the 6th, 
the squadron commander called me in and said, hey, we got a problem. You're assigned to a crew on a B-17C, which is 12 volt electrical system. Your camera is 24 volt. So I'm going to transfer you to a Model E B-17, which was 24 volt. So I'm going to ask you uh, and the flight surgeon just to trade, trade airplanes, trade crews. So we did. He said, we're going to be flying over the Marshall Islands, out close to the Philippines. He says, uh, we think that the Japanese are doing something in the Marshall Islands that they don't want us to know about. So when we go over there, I said, I want you to take a lot of pictures as we fly over. So I want you to have your camera up and running when we do that. So we did. We left San Francisco uh, about 9.30 Saturday night of the 6th. And there were a total of 12 airplanes. And we all were all flying and taking off individually. Because flying formation at night is... Uh, not only dangerous, but it's very fuel-consuming. And they wanted us to be sure and get there because this was the first time that the Model E had made that long a flight. So they pumped every ounce of gas in the tanks they could. And he said, we're not going to send any ammunition with you. Uh, guns, the machine guns, yes. You pick up your ammunition when you get to Hickam Field in Hawaii because, you know, ammunition is very heavy. And they didn't want, they wanted us to make sure that we got there. So we did. And uh, the pilot asked me to go up in the nose of the airplane to kind of balance the, the CG a little bit better. So I went up in the nose for a takeoff. And, uh, you know, the red lights at the end of a airport runway, uh, he pushed the throttle wide open and with the brakes locked, and then on, everything was okay, so he brake released and away we went. And, do you know, I swear to this day that the wheels were still on the ground when we went through those red lights. Because you could feel where, when the wheels left the ground. But we made it, because right off the end was water. Uh, we made it, but very slowly began to climb and go out over Golden Gate Bridge. And this is the Model E B? No, it's Model E. And, and is it what, a B-17 though? Or? Oh yes, B-17 yeah, 17. E. Yeah, okay. You see, up until then, there were, they were all 12 volt systems. Then they changed over to 24 volt. From then on, everything was 24 volt. And uh, so the, uh, the bombardier and myself and the navigator were up in the nose. So the bombardier and myself tried to keep out of the way as much as possible, the navigator, because after all, that guy was the most important one on board. And uh, I tried to nap a little bit, but that didn't work. Uh, finally, about daylight, oh, first, uh, the only communication between planes was that the pilots were to report into the squadron commander, just uh, giving the, uh, his name. No, no other information, and the squadron commander would know that when he reported in that everything was okay. Otherwise he would have said so. And they did that every hour. Finally about daylight, the navigator said we shouldn't be sighting land. No land in sight. Just cloud formations out there that look like mountains. But they weren't, they were just clouds. So the pilot says, all right, I will do a slow 360 turn for you to take some new readings. So we did, and the navigator said, no, everything's all right. 
Well, later on we found out that we were bucking a headwind that they didn't know about. It slows down a little bit. Finally, we did sight land. So I climbed back up and went back in the tail section where my camera was. And uh, um, finally, we came around Diamond Head. And uh, I had my camera out because I wanted to get some pictures of Honolulu. Because we were offshore about oh, a mile offshore at about 2,000 feet. I took a couple pictures of that, and I'm looking up ahead, and I see these anti-aircraft fire the smoke, you know. And I said, well, that looks like anti-aircraft fire that I was seeing back home in the newsreels of the war going on in Europe. I said, well, that can't be. This is Hawaii. So we continued on, and he made the approach to land at Hickam Field. And the, at that time, the uh, approach to land at Hickam Field was right over the entrance to Pearl Harbor. We were down probably oh, 500 feet, something like that. And there were just airplanes all over the place and uh, lots of buildings burning and whatnot. So he pulled up and did a go around and made another attempt to land. The same thing happened. Well, he did this three times. And on one time, while I was back there in the tail, I heard a noise that sounded like hailstones on a tin roof. I looked out the, the side gunner's window there, and there was two Jap fighters right on our tail, firing at us. I said, oh boy, that's... I don't like that. So, uh, for, this was on a second go around. For some reason, we don't know for sure why, they stopped firing and passed us on the left. We think it was because either they were all low on fuel or they ran out of ammunition. One of the two. They just stopped firing and passed us. And close enough that I could see the pilots' faces and they were just grinning from ear to ear uh, as they passed us. And that's when I took, I took pictures of them doing that. That's what I have it back here. And um, finally, on the third go around, the pilot told us on intercom, he said, we're going in this time regardless because the fuel gauge shows empty. So fortunately, uh, all four engines were still turning when we touched down. And it turned off to the right. You see, they did not touch the runway. They didn't bomb the runway at all. As we came to a stop, uh, an airport tug came out to uh, meet us. He says, get out of there fast. He says, we're being attacked by the Japs. So the crew chief said, throw everything that's combustible, throw it out, out the, do out the, wind out the door, in case uh, uh, incendiary bullets, he didn't want the airplane to catch on fire. So we did. And uh, after we got everything out, I did a strafing, there was a plane came over and did a strafing run and hit us again. But very luckily, none of us were touched, were hit. The airplane was, but we were not. We, none of us were. But uh, I started taking pictures in, someone on the ground. Uh, I had this same camera. And uh, the next morning, that would be December 8th, I went to the squadron commander, I looked him up, and told him what I had in the way of uh, the film that I'd shot with my own camera. He says, well, see if you can find some place to get it processed. So I walked over to Hicken Field, what had been the photo lab, it was just smoking ruins then, but there was some old master sergeant slowly walking around the building. So I figured he knew something about it. So I introduced myself 
told him what I had. He says, well, I've got a Jeep over here. He says, come on, let's, I'll take you up to Fort Shafter, which is a signal core. Uh, their lab up there, they weren't touched up there. So we went up there and they said, yeah, we'll have, come back tomorrow and we'll have the film ready for you. Uh, so the same master sergeant, we made arrangements to meet at a certain time and place. Went back up there and some captain came out and says, I'm sorry, we can't give you your film. I said, well, why not? It's my personal film, my personal camera. Uh, he says, well, the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox at the time, had flown over there and they showed these pictures to him. He says, I want those. I said, well, can I even look at the prints? No, can't, you can't look at them. You can't see them. You can't have them. I said, well, come on, this is my own film. At least I should be able to look at them. No, you can't do it. Well, this master sergeant took me by the arm and says, come on, I, he could see I was getting pretty upset. So he says, come on, we can't do anything more here. Well, what upset me was that knowing that they were going back to Washington, D.C., and here we just were entered a war, they'd get lost back there and I'd never see them again. Well, later on, I was sent down to the Fiji Islands, our crew was, and uh, to repair an engine of a B-17 down there. And I saw an Australian news magazine and there was one of my pictures on the front page, the front cover. So I knew they'd been released. Well, on the 29th of December issue of Life magazine of 41, there's another one of my pictures on the cover, the lead story, not to cover the magazine, but the lead story, there was one of my pictures. And so I knew that they'd survived. And, anyway. But I didn't hear anything more then until I think it was about November of 41. I had been sent back to the States to go to the uh, school, uh, Signal Corps school. And one day I received a brown manila envelope and there was my original negatives inside. But that envelope, you know, this size, was covered on the front and back with forwarding APO numbers. It had been all over the Pacific and all over the United States trying to catch up with me. And I was so glad to see those negatives, I threw the envelope away. And to this day, I wish I had kept that envelope. But uh, to retrace back up a little bit. Uh, when the squadron commander, uh, I wanted to see him about getting this film developed. He said, I have some bad news. He says, that flight surgeon that you and changed places with was the only one in our squadron that was killed that morning. Strafing Japanese fighters got him. The man that I just changed places with the night before. That still hits me pretty hard right here because it's, well, in a lot of cases during the war after and even after the war, I feel like, uh, you know Jimmy, you know who Jimmy Doolittle is. He and I became pretty good friends because uh, I was, we formed an air museum down there and he came up five different times. He and his wife came up to, just to visit. And uh, he wrote a book. And the title of the book was, I Never Could Be So Lucky Again. That's exactly the way I feel. So many close calls and I'm still here all in one piece. But uh, I uh, transferred to the Army Signal Corps 
because I knew they had photo did, had photo department. Because as an aerial photographer in the Air, Army Air Corps, they had decided to mount the cameras in these uh, fighter planes permanently with an electric cord and the switch going up to the pilot so he could turn them on and off the pilot. So that did away with my job. So I, that's why I asked for a transfer. And they assigned me to a combat uh, signal corps photographic uh, company. And I was placed in charge of one of six what they call combat photo units of uh, seven men. We got orders to go get on board and go out to the Pacific and uh, they sent us down. We didn't know where we were going, but it was New Caledonia, if you know, down towards Australia. That's where company headquarters was. And uh, I had asked the squadron, the company commander if I could take my unit to the Fiji Islands because I had been there before with the Air Corps. And I knew a few people there. He said, okay, that's all right. So we got on board a ship and went back to the Fiji Islands. I spent four months, uh, no, nine months there. Nine months in Fiji. And uh, one of the interesting uh, jobs was I got a telephone call one day from uh, my boss, who was a major in a G2 office, intelligence. He says, get your camera and plenty of film and meet me up here in 15 minutes. Okay. So I did and uh, there was a staff car at the curb waiting for us. Got in and headed out and he didn't say a word about what we were going to do. Finally, as we were approaching, I knew where we were headed because I knew we were headed towards the airport by the road that the driver was taking. He said, we're going out to the airport and uh, the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, is coming in and we're going out to meet her. And he says, would you be uh, upset or excited or by photographing a, a VIP? And I said, no, that's my job, is doing photography. So we came out there and uh, a B-24 was landing right at the time. If you know what a B-24 is, well, it was consolidated. Four engine, high wing, uh, had longer range uh, than a B-17 and could carry a little heavier bomb load. They had converted one of the B-24s for her. The bomb bay was completely sealed off uh, was, that was her boudoir, if you want to call it that. But they had a full crew of machine gun uh, men on board with live ammunition and everything, just in case someone uh, found out where, who they were. They were prepared to defend her. And she was dressed in a Red Cross uniform. And she, uh, the uh, commanding general, came to me and he says, I want you to be her personal photographer all the time that she's here in Fiji. Wherever she goes, you go. So, of course, I did. And then he brought her over and introduced her to me. And we shook hands. And she says, now, Lieutenant, if you want to take a picture of me and I'm not standing in the right position that you want me to, you tell me what to do. Okay, I said, all right. Well, in the staff car going back to the office, I'm thinking to myself, I'm supposed to tell the president's wife what to do? Something wrong here. But she was a very gracious lady. She visited all, every man that was wounded that was in the hospital there, that had been brought in from various places around the Pacific. She visited with every one of them, and some of them were very badly wounded. She'd bend over and put her ear down to hear what he was trying to say, 
And the first thing she would say to each one that she went to, she said, what, what town are you from? So they'd tell her. Because in some cases, she would know some news about that particular town. So she would tell them. And they would just laugh, just grin from ear to ear to hear some news about their hometown. But that's the way she did. And she spent uh, probably 10 minutes at least with each man talking to him and uh, telling him about what was going on back in the States and so on. And that's the way the whole day, uh, the whole time she was there. Uh, she was just a very gracious lady. And the men that were wounded were so amazed to see the president's wife there coming to visit with them. It was a very strong moral factor for, for, the, for as far as they were concerned. Uh, they, I talked to some of them later on. And in fact, I was going down the aisle, uh, they're taking pictures, and I see one man in the bed there. Hey, I know him. Well, it come to be, come to find out it was a man, a neighbor back home. His dad had been working for my dad. And here he was in the bed in the hospital down there. And we, to this day, he's still living. And we've been very good friends since then. And, uh, oh, we went, uh, they would assign us to uh, various groups wherever they wanted us. 41st Division or the 1st Cavalry Division or 2nd Island Command, wherever they wanted a combat photographer, like Guadalcanal, Bougainville, New Guinea, all of these, all these islands, we never knew which day, the next day, where we were going to be. All we had to do was, I, most of my work was motion, motion picture work. The others, they had uh, men in our unit doing motion picture work and some of them doing still photography. So they'd send usually one of each to each location. And most of that was uh, used to send back to here to the States for, I suppose, for propaganda or whatever. But then I received orders from the company headquarters in New Caledonia to come back to New Caledonia from Fiji. I got back there and they said, uh, we have just received orders to send a crew to New Zealand. We want you to take your crew to New Zealand. What are we supposed to do? You're supposed to photograph the New Zealand war effort in supporting the troops in the South Pacific. Well, that's a pretty broad uh, assignment. So we got on board an airplane. Uh, it was a, one of the uh, Martin uh, flying boats and down to Auckland, and they'd arranged ahead of time for us to uh, use a Navy uh, um, Oh, what do you call those kind of, they carry about six people. Station wagon, station wagon. Well, that was a new experience for me because uh, here's a left-hand drive vehicle and the right, uh, driving on the left-hand side of the road. And so I had to be pretty careful because being the officer in charge, I was the driver. And... Uh, we photographed all kinds of things, and there was a couple of things I remember very distinctly. It was a, a creamery, New Zealand creamery, and the owner wanted to buy some pasteurizing uh, equipment from the States. The New Zealand government said, no, you wait until some, that equipment is developed here, then you buy that equipment. Well, he was pretty upset about that because he couldn't see the difference. But anyway, another thing was uh, down in the South Island, 
they raised lots of potatoes down there. So we photographed uh, lots of potato growing equipment and uh, what they were doing. And they were, uh, the creamery, they were sending um, a, B29, a B-24 down there once a week from the various islands in the South Pacific to pick up a load in the Bombay of 10-gallon cans of fresh milk to bring back to the hospitals in the South Pacific. Uh, because uh, when you're wounded, uh, sick, or whatever, uh, good fresh milk uh, was tasted pretty good. And it was a morale factor and health factor also. So they did that every week, and we photographed that. Another thing was uh, in Wellington, General Motors had a big factory there where they built trucks. Well, they converted that to rebuilding damaged army vehicles from the war zone. If a jeep or pickup or a weapons carrier or whatever was damaged some, they'd ship it down there for General Motors to repair and send it back into service again, which is a very good idea. And we photographed all of that. And then I asked the uh, New Zealand Air Force if they had an airplane, they could take me up and shoot some aerial photographs of New Zealand, including the Hermitage and so forth. They said, well, yeah, we can take care of that. So I took a motion picture camera and a still camera, both, in the back seat of a two-place airplane. And uh, I got some real good pictures. Uh, back there, uh, especially of a glacier that was uh, moving down the mountain. At the end of it, it was melted off and formed a lake down at the end. And another place, there was a ski resort called the Hermitage. We photographed that. And Mount Cook is the highest island in the South Pacific. So I, he did a circle around that. We did photograph that too. Well, it was uh, got some good film, and uh, from then they came back. Uh, we came back to the New Caledonia, and then they said we uh, have orders for you to go to New Guinea. But first, you go up to New, uh, Caledonia and New, and uh, Bougainville uh, to photograph some of the war that was going on up there. And one of the things on, New, on the Guadalcanal, that land was very rich and good soil. So uh, somebody got the idea, well, how about growing some vegetables down here for the troops? They're growing them right here. So they sent some farm equipment down from the States and did. And they were growing sweet corn and potatoes and well, just lots of things. And they were very good quality. Uh, the soil was just excellent. Then we went on to Bougainville, and then came back, uh, and they said, okay, we have orders for you now to get on board the uh, uh, Laureline, which was a sightseeing tourist ship, between mainly between Hawaii and the States during peacetime. So I took my crew, and we went on board, went over to the New Guinea, but first we made a stop in uh, uh, island uh, in one of the island uh, harbors there in New Guinea. I forget the name of it. Anyway, after the war was over, I found out my brother was on sh in the shore there in the quartermaster, and here I was on the ship. And neither one of us knew it. But. Uh, we went on to New Caledonia, I mean, uh, Hollandia, Hollandia, New Guinea. Well, we didn't do anything there very much. Uh, uh, it was mainly a staging area for going into the Philippine Islands. And uh, troop ships were leaving and uh, uh, various Navy ships were going up and they flew us up after they had made a beachhead up there and secured an airfield 
they flew us up in what the, the Air Force called a, a C-54, which is a four-engine transport. So we got up there and did a lot of uh, work, and uh, one of the things we were assigned was to go with the 41st Division to make a beachhead at Zamboango. We made the beachhead there at Zamboango. And uh, we had the jeeps had all been waterproofed ahead of time with a high pipe for the uh, carburetor intake and for the exhaust. Because we were on, a, on board an LST. As soon as he makes the beachhead and touches land, the gate drops down and we go. Well, I don't know what happened, whether he hit a rock or something underneath. Anyway, he was not close enough to the beach. I went off the end of that ramp. I was up to here in water. But the Jeep kept going because it had been waterproof and we got up on dry land. And uh, soon after we were on board uh, on the land, um, the colonel came over and he says, you get your camera, a motion picture camera, and another man with a still camera, and get on that weapons carrier, and they're going up the mountains. There's some guerrillas up in the mountains. There were some of our own people from the 19th bomb group that had escaped the Japanese and gone up in the mountains with some friendly uh, Filipinos. They spent the war up there, and they would uh, come down and give the Japanese a bad time down in Zamboango. And they finally made contact with uh, a U.S. submarine. They brought some radio equipment in for them so they could have better communications. And uh, so they were sending uh, uh, intelligence reports by radio uh, out to the submarines and whatnot. And so he wanted us to go up and get them and bring them back. So we did. And uh, they were just so happy to see us. They just were just overjoyed. Of course, they knew it was coming by because they'd been informed by radio. But... Uh, after the war was over with, uh, and we were living up here in uh, Port Angeles, I joined the Orchid Society, which we have here. And uh, one day, uh, a man came to me and he said, uh, I think I have a picture of you. I said, yeah. He said, weren't you in Zamboango in the Philippines? I said, yeah. You came up the mountains and, and picked up... Uh, these uh, gorillas? I said, yeah. Well, he says, I was uh, the commander of the group uh, with this weapons carrier and so forth. He said, I took a picture of you. Well, the next meeting we had Dorcas Society, he brought me a, cop a picture. Here, here I am with all the cameras on standing in the back of that weapons carrier. What a small world. No kid. Wow. What, so you were shooting 16 mil film? Yes. So how big was your camera that you had to haul around for that? Was it a Well, it was a not very big, but not, not very big camera, 16 millimeter, uh, just 100 foot rolls. Uh, we did have some 35 100 foot roll cameras. Uh, we didn't use too much of that. We did some. And then uh, the still photography was all 4x5 speed graphics, like I have here. But the, uh, we did a lot of 16 millimeter motion picture work. And apparently that was used back in the States here for newsreels and so forth. And was that kind of year to document the war from a positive light? Or did they just say... Go shoot what you think's interesting. Well, a little both. It was to show combat 
uh, actual combat and show, well, like a bunch of guys lined up in a mess line, for example. Uh, just anything that... Uh, our, our job was uh, pretty open. I mean, it pretty much left it up to us to photograph whatever uh, looked interesting uh, needed to be photographed and documented. And by the way, one of the officers in our company was killed in uh, Bougainville. But that, as far as I know, is the only one that was we lost down there during the war. Did you carry a weapon then, or did you have somebody that... We had a, a forty-five caliber pistol on our belt. In other words, that was developed in the Philippine Islands way back when, because thirty-eight caliber pistols would stop, not stop these... Uh, well, I don't know what they were. They were the bad guys, anyway, in the Philippines. They wouldn't stop them. But a forty-five had enough force it would knock them down. So that's why they, we were all equipped with forty-fives. And uh, a canteen of water. And uh, then we had to take uh, uh, a pill because the water in the Philippines was uh, not, very, uh, not very good. These, um, there were sort of a distant, I don't know what you call them. Anyway, we had to put 19 of those pills in one canteen of water. Well, it made the water taste terrible. But after all, it was uh, for our own good, our own health uh, to do that. So we drank it whether we liked it or not. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. I know when I'm out shooting and stuff like that, the rest of the world kind of disappears around me. Is that how it is for a combat photographer? I mean, because you're in some kind of hairy situations out there once in a while. Very often. Very often. Yes. Uh, there were so many cases, like one time in the Philippines, uh, one of my men and myself, were going from one location to another, <clears throat> and it was no trees there. We're going from one grove of trees to another place, and all of a sudden here comes a mortar. We can hear it coming, a Japanese mortar. And uh, so we kind of ducked down, and it landed about 100 yards over here, and right away there was another one came over here. Well, you know where the third one was going to be, right in between. They were just bracketing us. So we dove into a foxhole, and sure enough, the next one hit just about 10 yards away, maybe even, maybe even closer than that. But uh, we stayed down there for, oh, probably an hour. And finally we got brave enough to get up and run to the trees. But there's... So many places that, uh, like Jimmy Doolittle said, I never could be so lucky again. Did you carry all your film with you then? I mean, did, oh, yeah. were you pretty heavily loaded? Yes. And then would you send it back somewhere to be, you yes. would shoot it and send it back to be processed? Or? Well, for a while it was sent back to the States. <clears throat> for one thing, it was a color film. And color film had just come out on the market. And we had no facilities for processing color film. Some of it was black and white, and we did have facilities for black and white. And black and white still photographs, yes, we could process that, yeah. But the color film was sent back. Did you see that Channel 9 uh, out of Seattle, in fact, I think it started airing this week, is doing uh, World War II in color, they've no, gone. They've gone and and found a lot of this color footage, and are now uh, they've edited a full documentary on it. That's well, probably some of the stuff that I shot. I'll bet you. I'll bet you it is. Because uh, we were shooting color film because it was uh, new on the market, and 
uh, we were getting reports back after it had been processed that uh, it was looking good. So my company commander says, keep using it. Go for it. So we did. And uh, like in the Philippines, uh, General MacArthur had received word from his G2 that the Japanese were going to kill all the internees in the Santo Tomas University. That was all the English-speaking people in the Philippines the Japs had put in Santo Tomas. And they said that he had received word that they were going to kill all of them. So he told the 1st Cavalry Division, the whole division, he says, you go straight to Santo Tomas, don't stop for anything. Just go straight there as fast as you can get there. So we did. And uh, we caught them they, before they did. But they were getting ready to. So uh, we've got all of those guys were put in prison, taken prisoner, I should say. And those people, I don't know how they survived. They were just skin and bones. Their food for a day was a little bowl of rice water, rice soup, with hardly any rice in it, just mainly water. I don't know how those people survived. But there's a lady that lives in Squim here. She was in that Santo Tomas, but she was only at that time only three years old. Her mother, and she, and her sister were interned in Santo Tomas. And of course she has a grown family now. And uh, I've been trying to find some of the film that I shot because she wants to look at it. I have probably 50,000 feet at home of uh, 16 millimeter film. And I have, oh, hundreds and hundreds of black and white still photographs, four by five. The sad part is that uh, so much all during that time, you, you, I didn't write captions for all that stuff. But some of it, uh, it's still, there's a few cobwebs up here, but uh, I can still write uh, pretty much a title or a caption for each one. I've just got to do it. So you have, it's interesting because you have, which would have been my perspective if I had been there, I think, a very unique perspective because your perspective of, of a lot of the war was through the eyepiece, mm -hmm. documenting history, telling right. a story, you know, showing people what was happening. And it's, uh, a lot of that film, I assume, has been in storage in D.C. and uh, I hopefully, like you folks, uh, can make use of it. Uh, the film that I shot, I know for a fact that it's in, two, in uh, the Library of Congress and the uh, National Archives. I know they're there. They're, I still have the original negatives, but they have copy negatives, obviously, and they've been assigned numbers so that you or anyone else can ask for those by number. It'll be interesting when you see the tape that we already edited, if any of your footage is in there. Because, oh. because we, that's where we got a lot of our footage. Either, either personal photographs people have, or we had to go back to the National Archives to get film footage, and, and we keep building more and more material so that we can put this and make it accessible to people. That's the nice thing about the Internet now is a lot of these photographs, rather than having to go back to D.C. to look up stuff, you can get online and start looking, and, and people can find grandparents and fathers and, you know, pictures of, you know, where did my dad serve, what did he do? So. Well, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that uh, the people or the public or whatever are waking up to the fact that American history is very important. Because our kids growing up, they don't know what uh, all of this stuff that's happened. And I've discovered in reading some of these history books that they use now, a lot of stuff in there is not true. It's what the publisher and the author, the way they think it should be. 
not really what really did happen. And I don't, that's, that's too bad. I'm sorry, but that's, I don't like that. We, uh, the, the edited show is called When We Were Kids, We Went to War. But originally the title, <coughs> title was going to be World War II as told by dot, 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 because you write history books a lot of times are written third hand, first of all. History is not a science. But if you and I were even to go to the same event and look at it, would you and I see exactly the same thing? Oh, probably not. And that's why it's so important to have all these different perspectives of what, what happened so that, that different people can look at it and get a concept of, of more the reality of it. To, that was the other purpose was they wanted to de hollywood fi they didn't want oh, to, yeah. you know. There's one. There's been several motion pictures about Pearl Harbor. They made one during the war. We're still going on down in Hollywood. It was just called December seventh, nineteen forty-one. That was the title of it, and that was more accurate than anything they've done since then. Uh, Tora 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 was fairly good, but this last one that Disney made was a joke. Uh, the only scene I remember that was really true on this uh, one that Disney made was that scene in the Navy hospital where the nurses and the doctors were just going crazy trying to take care of everybody, trying to help all these people. There were so many. That was true. I mean, those doctors, those nurses were just, just going crazy trying to help all of this people that were coming in there. They were bringing them in in uh, trailers, just laid out on a flatbed trailer. And, oh, it was just terrible. But uh, that was one part that was, was really true. I saw that happen myself. I still haven't watched that one for that reason. When I want to go watch something for entertainment, I'll rent it and watch it. But I've, I've already been told that... Well, when you came in, it's interesting because Pearl Harbor, I mean, now, of course, it's a part of history. In hindsight, it's always twenty twenty. But flying into that, could you believe it was real? Or did it take a while for you to even believe that this... It took a while to soak in. That's right. Because when I first saw the aircraft fire when we were going along out off the coast of... Uh, Honolulu, and I saw that anti-aircraft fire. It reminded me of the newsreels I had seen back here in the States of the war going on in Europe. I said, hey, that can't be. This is Hawaii. Well, we knew something was real bad, and of course when these two fighters jumped us, and I could see the that red meatball on the wings on the side of the airplane, we know that. And then when we landed, and this guy came out in his tug and told us to get out of there, we're being attacked by the Japs, well, that, that clinched it right then. But it was very hard. A lot of people have said, why didn't I take more pictures when we were still flying around? over? Because when he would make these go-arounds, it was right over Pearl Harbor. And here I had the camera right here in my hand. The only answer I can give is that I was just so flabbergasted at what I was seeing that I forgot about the fact I had the camera right here. So I could have taken some excellent photographs looking right down on Pearl Harbor. But I didn't do it. I did take some of the, uh, those two fighters and uh, history people have told me that those are the first and only aerial air-to-air -air photographs of the United States at war. Wow. And I guess that would be true. Because we had, hadn't even landed yet. And it had just come around, Pearl, around Diamond Head. So I, I guess that's true. And uh, uh, those are some that, uh, that you have here that we have brought. Do you remember? Because I would have been the same way. It would have taken me a while before I went, oh yeah, camera. I mean, yeah. I would have been so aghast or surprised yeah. or shocked. When you flew over Pearl, did, were you looking down at the ships or were you? Yeah, yeah. So by that time, had a lot of the damage already been done or oh, was yes. that the? Yes, 
We got there, they say, about a half hour after it started. Well, of course, it went on for a long time after that. And one other uh, incident that I haven't told you about yet is uh, on one of the approaches we were making to land, which is right over the entrance to Pearl Harbor at that time, uh, the crew chief, I didn't see this, but the crew chief up in front said he was looking out his window there and a bomb came down right in front of the wing. So he looked up and there was a Japanese bomber up above and down below was one of our ships coming out of the out of Pearl Harbor. And he was trying to get that ship. And here we're flying right between them. Another case of where I never could be so lucky. Because it, he said it was only about three feet in front of the wing when the bomb went down. And that's the other part that's important for people to know, which you've already said earlier, but the fact that you had guns but no ammunition because you were just on a transport flight, basically. That's right. Because, uh, you know, ammunition is very heavy. And they wanted us to be sure and get there. So he says, when you get to Hickam Field, pick up your ammunition then to go on to the Philippines. We had the guns, but they were not mounted. That's just... And fortunately for me, those two side gunner positions in the back, one on each side, there was no glass in there nothing in there, so I had easy access to stick my camera out there and shoot pictures. Where, where did you normally take Did you wander the plane to take pictures different places, or was there a specific place normally that you would... Normally, uh, during peacetime, uh, in the radio compartment, you pull up a, a big trap door in the floor, and there's a compartment down there with a hole uh, to mount a, an aerial camera. That's where they take verticals from that uh, aerial camera position down there. Um, you've probably seen pictures of that one B-17 sitting there with no tail, sitting up like this. Well, that was the airplane I was originally assigned to. That's the one the flight surgeon was in that got killed. You see, what happens is that the magnesium flares are stored in the radio compartment. Well, you know what happens to magnesium when uh, uh, an incendiary bullet hits it. It just burns white hot. So that happened on when he was making his approach to land. So when he touched down, the airplane broke in two at that point. And the tail went this way and the airplane went another way. But if I had been on that airplane, I'd have been in that tail section. But that's why it was sitting like this, because the tail was gone, because the magnesium had burned it in two there. Wow. Huh. <clears throat> Do you feel that there's a message that needs to be left for future generations that you and I may never meet, that the history books are leaving out of World War II? Well, yes. Uh, reality. What really did happen? Not some Hollywood story about it, because that gives people a wrong impression. Because our younger people believe that. They believe that. And it's not true. So I think we need to do uh, maybe what you're doing. Uh, the, real, the real thing the correct information. Our history books need to be rewritten and the real truth uh, written in those history books, not just what some publisher thinks it sh should be. For example, on these history books, they have around the borders of each page real fancy colored artwork. Well, that makes it more expensive, the book more expensive, and it takes up space that could be used for the word, printed word. And to me, it's distracting as I'm trying to read this column, have all this stuff around, going around it. Um, I don't know why they put it in there, but it should not be there. And the, uh, 
the man that invited me, the teacher that invited me out to one of the schools, uh, I pointed that out to him. And he didn't, he didn't realize it. He says, yeah, I understand what you mean. I agree. It's the way it, it should not be there. And I said, isn't there any way that the teachers or the school boards can review these books before they buy a quantity of them? He said, yeah, there is, but most of them don't do it. But they should read these books before they buy enough for a whole class. Because I'm sure there's many publishers that publish history books, and some of them have got to be more accurate than the one I saw. I just couldn't believe it. And I told him, I pointed out what, well, he just had, had to agree that that's right. They need to do it, but they just haven't done it. 